Hi everyone, welcome to episode two of our Leaders in Sustainability interview series um, run by Outlaw Social. Uh, I'm really excited today to have Scott Poynton uh, joining us. Um, it's going to add a lot of value to everyone who watches this. Um, a very brief introduction to Scott uh, and then I'll hand it over uh, to you to do a full introduction. Um, so Scott uh, is uh, a previous founder and CEO of the Forest Trust. Um, he's a founder of A Different Way and also most recently founder of the Pond Foundation amongst lots of other stuff. Um, welcome to the, the series, Scott. It's good to have you on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Leo. I look forward to talking to you. Awesome. Um, so I thought it would be really useful um, just for people who are watching this um, further down the line, Scott, maybe if you could start with telling us a bit more about who you are and, yeah, I guess, I guess your your background. You've got a, a, a great story to share. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Yeah, well, so I'm Australian and uh, grew up in, in rural Australia, not far from Melbourne, and um, was very blessed at a young age. Having grown up with animals, I decided I was going to be a vet. But uh, three days after my 15th birthday, I was very lucky that uh, an old British forester, a fellow called uh, Richard St. Barb Baker, who had travelled the world most of his life trying to inspire people to protect forests and plant trees, uh, had visited Australia and had been interviewed. And I don't know, as a young bloke, I was doing inside on a Sunday afternoon, but there was this radio on the broadcast. Who put the radio on? I don't know. I was meant to hear it, I think. And, uh, and, I, and I did. I sat down and listened to that broadcast for 30 minutes. And after about the second minute, he had me. And I realised that my, my life's work should be devoted to following in his footsteps and trying to protect forests. I had a great love of forests. And, and that's what I've done. And I think it's, it is lucky because a lot of young kids don't have that that you know that clear idea of what they they're going to do and as a consequence you know when I sort of came to a fork in the road I was able to say I think I'll go this way because it's going to get me closer to that that opportunity so I, I went to university in in Canberra I studied forestry I worked in forestry in Tasmania and um, got an opportunity to come to the UK and study I studied a master's in the UK which was which was a great opportunity okay and then uh, went back to Tasmania and then I got this opportunity to go to Vietnam and work in the Mekong Delta and it was great because you know I wasn't sure whether this overseas life living in the tropics was going to be for me but I loved it I, I really loved it and it was a great project and um, was there for a couple of years and then that was it and off I went more or less being a consultant doing lots of things and I happened to be in the UK in London um, working in London in uh, in 1998 and I'd been, I'd been sent over there for my sins. Um, usually it went the other way around, but I was sent back to the UK and uh, to do some work and um, set up an office there for our consulting company. And because of my experience in Vietnam, I'd been looking at the garden furniture that had been flooding into Europe since okay. 1995. And what I'd found for B&Q, the, the big UK retailer, yeah. that that furniture was being made in Vietnam, in factories in Vietnam, but from logs that had been ripped out of the forests of Cambodia and yeah. uh, with all sorts of destruction and human rights abuses, trucked over the border into Vietnam and then mass produced as furniture. So I, I warned B&Q about that in, in 1996. Um, they were taking action to do something about it. But in 1998, a Global Witness, which is a, a UK based um, NGO, uh, exposed this and there was a campaign across the whole of Europe and so because I'd been working on it, everyone turned to me and said, look, can you help us? And um, and so that was the start of the Forest Trust. You mentioned it in the introduction. And um, we set it yeah. up as, an, as a not-for-profit. And it was really designed to help companies take responsibility for their sustainability issues. Instead of saying, oh, that's that's my supplier. I've got nothing to do with that. It's like, well, you're profiting from the sale of that product that's linked to those that environmental and social uh, disaster. So you really do have responsibility. And up until then, no companies had really taken responsibility for that, but we managed to convince them to do that and set up the TFT and and away we went. And uh, after a couple of years, you know, we managed to turn around the garden furniture sector, which was a bit of a job, but we got there. Um, then I, off I went to other shores and we, um, <clears throat> we um, the TFT did a lot of work in Africa. We got the first forest sustainably certified in the Congo Basin. Um, and then in 2010, there was a big campaign against Nestle. Some people might remember. Um, there was a, 
an office worker with a Kit Kat and he opened the Kit Kat and the first finger was an orangutan's finger. Yeah. He bit into it and all the blood went out and the Greenpeace did a great great campaign and of course it upset us late, let's say that. Um, and uh, but I'd also already been doing some work on palm oil at that stage and helped Nestle to mediate that dispute with Greenpeace and uh, and uh, write the world's first no deforestation commitment back in May of 2010. Yeah. And then various other companies in the palm oil sector, pulp and paper sector, big commitments to walk away from deforestation. And so had been really at the heart of that. You know, I was the person in the dark room. Um, negotiating and mediating never really on the front of the cameras or anything like that but i i like being in those places and um and we managed to bring about some quite major changes so yeah um felt good about that and just really to complete the story you mentioned at the start i was doing other things i, I stepped aside from tft at the end of 2000 and, uh, well 15 as the ceo transitioned in the new leadership and then left in august 2019 and set up my own little company and now the Pond Foundation, which we're looking at climate change and what we can do to support individuals. And I'm sure we'll talk about that in a minute, but individuals and families and businesses to take strong climate action. Yeah. Wow. Uh, thank, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, this is some version. Sorry, I went on a bit long. Yeah, no, and I think we have discussed this before, Scott. I think there's so much that you have um, done in the past. We, we could speak for hours probably about that. Um, but I, something that I picked up quite strongly in our previous conversations is, uh, and, and you repeated this quite a lot, is that you believe there's so much more work to do. Um, and, and that's why you're you're looking to the future. So uh, yeah, I think it would be really nice um, if you could give us yeah an introduction into, into the ventures that you're working on just now. Um, yeah, and, and I think there'll be some lessons that we can pull out um, as the conversation goes on. So yeah, I tell tell us about um, what you're doing now. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Well, it's really interesting. I, I have a colleague who asked me at one stage, she was, I'm one of these people who's always looking forward and you never look back, but that's where a lot of the lessons are, right? You, yeah. you look at your failings, your, your, the things that didn't work. There's a lot of lessons to be learned there. You look at the things that did work and say, so what was the difference between the two? And it was really back in around, I think it was 2012 or 13, this mate of mine said, geez, all these things seem to be going really well. What's what's the recipe for success? I'm like, oh, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it. And I would say over a number of years I did. And, and what I realized, and, and it sounds a bit funky and a bit strange, but you know, when I, when I tell this story, people think, oh, golly, oh, golly, it's a bit weird. But the essence of my experience sitting in the dark rooms with the CEOs of some of the world's largest companies is that we were, I was able to, you know, we had Greenpeace, not not actually hanging off the building, but figuratively so, and a few other NGOs, you know, putting pressure on these companies. There's a lot of stress. And um, when I was able to get into that room with those leaders, the leadership team, I had to do a lot of work to build trust because, you know, who is this bloke? He's some Aussie fella, you know, um, and Greenpeace, you know, maybe he's a good mate of Greenpeace. And if we tell him things, maybe he'll end up on the front page of the paper. Yeah. So. Building trust was one of the key lessons that I learned, but what did we do with that trust? And the real lesson that I learned along the way was most people are pretty good. Like companies don't get out of bed in the morning, company leaders don't get out of bed in the morning and ask how many orangutans can I kill today? Uh, yeah. Generally not, or how, how many human rights violations can I perpetrate on the world today? They generally don't. Often they don't think about the consequences of their business. Um, so those things actually can happen, but it's not intentional. And I think what tends to happen is when the NGO campaigns come and they say, oh, you know, you'd, you'd link to all those things, they, they get upset. They say, that's not, you know, I'm, no, that's not what we're doing. And they get defensive and um, it takes them a little while. But the essence of my experience is that most people are pretty good. And, okay. um, but they're so busy in their head, in a way, looking at profit and loss statements, quarterly results, um, KPIs, work plans, budgets, all of this sort of thing. That some of those more, I guess you'd call them emotional things, and even to a degree spiritual things, like, do you really want to be screwing the planet? You know, excuse my language, but do you really want to be messing things up there? And yeah. generally the answer is no, but they don't really pay attention to the fact that it's happening. And so the NGOs were, you know, big wake up, you know, mirror to these people. You know, this is what you, you're doing. This is who you've become. Yeah. And they didn't always like what they saw. And so part of my job with the listening was really to 
help them get connected back to themselves. It sounds like I say, it sounds a bit strong. What's he talking about? Well, almost get out of your head and come back down and, you know, feel your way forward. Instead of thinking your way forward, feel your way forward. And it doesn't feel good when someone accuses you of human rights abuses, right? Um, it doesn't feel good when people accuse you of promoting child labor. It doesn't feel good when someone accuses you of um, destroying orangutan and killing orangutans and things like this. So all of these feelings come, but they're not equipped to handle it because they're all busy thinking about ways forward. And I think the essence of my experience is if we can get people to, I call it the most difficult, it's a, the most difficult, difficult 50 centimeter journey that you've ever taken in your life is to get from here down to your gut because I think for me that's yeah. where it is and sometimes some people have got a you know steel reinforced concrete block about here yeah and my job is to sort of jackhammer the way through and help them find their way down connect can, can I just ask a quick question on that yeah go ahead mate. yeah because so I completely understand the um the benefits of leading from the heart the gut um <laughs> But when you explained that you you kind of spoke about it being softer stuff, how, did did you come up a? You're talking about sort of global leaders, C-suite, really kind of profit oriented people. Did you come up against a lot of resistance when trying to talk through this? Um, yeah, you know what's interesting is the power of listening, right? The power, and I, I think I've, I've done a lot of introspection over my life and like what what worked and what didn't, and who am I as a person and. I think I'm a pretty good listener. I can talk the leg off a chair as well. It drives my wife crazy. <laughs> but uh, but I, I'm a good listener. And so when I was going into the room to, with those people, I didn't go in there to tell them what they should do. That was what the NGOs were doing. And, and they first and foremost needed to tell me how terrible that was and how awful it was. And that's not who they are as people and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, so my job was first and foremost to listen. And, and what I found was in that sense, you don't come up against resistance. If I went in there and said, right, you guys have got to do this, 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 and this, and go, well, then you're likely to hit resistance. Yeah. But if you just go in there and sit and listen quietly to people and, and respectfully, yeah. they haven't had anyone listen to them for a long time in that way. And and also because they're CEOs and you know chairs and founders of organizations that are, you know, biggest palm oil companies in the world, and you know, Nestle is the biggest food company in the world, you're talking to the senior people there, they're not used to being challenged. Yeah. Uh, in this way and not just challenged but challenged right to the core of who they are as people yeah and they believe they're out there trying to do the good work and you know to feed the world and do all these things and so it wasn't so much about resistance it was really just about listening and then yeah. over time you could sort of talk to them and say well what do you think we could do here and sometimes that would flip them off into anger again but eventually we found a way so my approach is is, is a sort of sort of soft approach i would say yeah. but um it's more a human approach. It's like, well, tell me what's on your mind. Tell me what's on your, you know, you know get, off, get the stuff off your mind and then let's get down into this part of the body. And I want to know how you're feeling. And it was when we got to that bit that we made amazing progress. When we could say, oh, they, they did this, they did that. That's all here. But when we got down into this part, how are you feeling about that? Oh, I feel terrible. You know, oh, geez, and my, my kids are coming home and it's in the front page of the papers and, you know, they're looking at me sideways over dinner. And this happened, you know, this happened. Yeah. And, and and so, well, okay, what are we going to do about that? Oh, I don't know, what do you reckon? And so then we'd, we'd work. And these are very clever people. These yeah. people set up companies and, yeah, they did clear forest. And uh, But, you know, it's not easy to clear a forest. You've got to be skilled at it. You've got to be able to organise logistics and all those sort of things. And if you've got those skills, you can just as easily turn those skills to protecting forests and yeah. protecting people um, and you know, safeguarding people's livelihoods as you can to destroying them. And and I always said that the greatest ally we have in the, you know, the work that we need to do to bring sustainability and, and to, pr to protect the environment and to protect people are the very people that have got us into the bad place we are now because they're really good at doing stuff. Um, if we can reorient them and get them operating from down here, they say, yeah, we need to grow more palm oil to feed the world. But you know what? I'm not going to be linked to deforestation and the death of orangutans and um, poisoning rivers and child labor. I'm not going to be linked to that. Yeah. And when they, when they operate from that place, they they do it. Um, yeah. So let's let's get them connected here 
here first and then here second. That's the essence of my essence of my experience. That's really to answer your first question. When yeah. this is prime, when this has primacy, it's it's profit and loss, all these things. Yeah. When this has primacy, this operates in service to that. So we can say, right, we do need to make money, and that's fine. Go ahead and make some money, but don't do it at the expense of the environment and, and people. And these people are absolutely brilliant at doing doing stuff. So let's yeah. unleash that but in service to what's good inside them, as opposed to, I'm not even thinking about that because I've got this concrete block here. I just need to make lots of money because culturally that gives me rewards. I send my kids to good schools. My mum and dad think I'm a success. My mates look at me in a good way, all that sort of stuff. That yeah. comes, that's here. But down here, you're like, I don't want to destroy those people's lives. Yeah. So that's the message, I think, you know, if we can. And so to get that place, people ask me, well, how did you do that? Well, I just did a lot of listening. They they make the journey themselves. I just travel it with them. I think there's a powerful sort of lesson in that about the the role of consultants, coaches, facilitators, and how important listening is. Um, and and I think it relates back to what you said about people being good at the core. Like if you can listen and help them arrive at conclusions, which actually probably at the core they believe. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really powerful, Scott. Yeah, no, thanks, man. That's what I've seen. It took me a while to work that out, to be honest with you, because, you know, I was just in it. I was in the moment. And uh, it was only after a lot of walks and you know, reflections, and I thought, you know, take it back to first principles. What is the essence of this change process? Yeah. And it really is that, helping people get connected here. So, you know, you asked me what I'm doing now. Well, part of my work is, is trying to help people get connected to that place. And uh, people said, gee, but you were the guy that went in there and did all that stuff. and made all those things and now you're taking people on nature walks and talking to CEOs in this more thoughtful way and helping them find this journey is is, is that what's happened to you I'm like, well, nothing I've learned the lesson of my work is that um, if we go one company at a time we're not going to make it we need to try and take this connection to scale okay. and so a different way uh, the company that I set up because I've always done things a bit of a different way uh, a different way is is where I'm really trying to focus on that whereas the pond foundation is really about saying okay it's great you've got them the different way you know so you're connected what do you need to do now and the idea of the pond foundation and the my carbon zero program that we've got there is to say this is you know the big issue we're facing in the planet right now is climate change uh, we can't wait for governments to solve it for us that hasn't gone well uh, you know we're coming up to the cop 26 there in uh, in scotland in november but, you know, those COP meetings have been going for decades and we're in yeah. big trouble. Um, so we can't wait for governments. So how do we inspire individuals and families and you know, businesses and other organisations to put their shoulder to the wheel and not just inspire them? How do we help them? Because a lot of people don't know. They, yeah, yeah, I want to do something, but they don't know what to do. So yeah. the idea of the Pond Foundation and now My Carbon Zero program is to say, look, Here's a, here's a way you can go about it. Here's what you can do as an individual. Here's what you can do as a business. Um, you know, I read a information the other day, a NatWest Bank survey uh, looking at SMEs in the UK. 88% of small, medium-sized enterprises in the UK want to do something about climate change, but don't know where to start. And I mean, that's amazing. I'm like, okay, let's help you. I've spent my yeah. life helping you know company leaders take a journey to a greater greater responsibility so let's help you let's help you in a way that you can afford because these people these companies are tiny they can't afford a sustainability manager right yeah so let's get some information online that you can pay a small license fee and you you get onto um, and then we can we can hold you by the hand through that journey so these are some of the things that I'm doing mate Amazing. Um, I am um, something I picked up when I was on the the pond foundation website um, I, pick, I, I honed in on a word and it was part of a sentence and it was about taking credible climate action and I think you're quite well placed to comment on this Scott and hopefully you can but there, there is a lot in the media just now about purpose washing, green washing, um, there's a lot of information um, and I think it potentially adds to the confusion of I want to do something but how do I get started absolutely yeah what um 
what's your, what's your opinion on purpose washing and green washing? Um, and how can we, how can people avoid it? Yeah, it's everywhere. I think that's the first thing to say. Marketing uh, departments of companies uh, have had generations to tell grand stories about all the good things they're doing. Uh, well, we're not in a great place. So, you know, we can smell a little something on our shoe there. Let's be yeah. a lot and let's leave it at that. Um, there's a bit of BS going around. And I think people, the general community are aware of that. And this does add to this confusion because, you know, someone's the, the CEO of a small company and they say, we want to do something. But then they read those articles in the paper and they say, oh, yeah, we don't want to put our scarce money to that. We want to make our money have an impact. And so it, it has a double or maybe many uh, faceted problem in the sense that the companies that are putting out that nonsense communications and marketing stuff are, are just misleading people. They are probably winning business because of it. Uh, but maybe the worst is that they just make everyone scared and cynical to take their own action. Yeah. Um, and we need the world to take action. So, look, I think it's disgraceful. Uh, um, and one of the things that we did at TFT was to really hold the companies that we worked with to account. We said, look, you you can't be doing this little thing over here. You know, let's go and build a school in Africa. Meanwhile, you're shipping in wood from destroyed forests in uh, in, in Cambodia, or you're shipping in palm oil. In your as an ingredient in your cosmetics or your food uh, that's come from destroyed rainforest and you, you know you're doing something in the local you're doing planting 100 trees in the local community that is greenwashing yeah right? so so what's the major impact that your business can have um, and focus on that and it's generally in their supply chain which is why i set up pft and focus on that but okay. on climate action i think the key thing is um and you know i I always feel a bit funny about this because I, I don't want to say, oh, you don't trust those guys because they're greenwashers, but you can trust me. No, I, I don't want to take that approach because who am I? I'm just some dodgy bloke from rural Australia. Um, I do have a bit of track record, which is, I think, stand me in, stands me in some good stead, but I don't want to be that person. Don't trust them, trust me. So what I want to say to people is, listen, here's a way that you can take your action. And part of that is um, reducing reducing your emissions uh, and here's some ways you can do that reduce emissions elsewhere and we want to stay away from any of this offsetting nonsense that's greenwashing um, here's how you can do that credibly work out not just the carbon that you've emitted into the into the atmosphere last year but all of your life if you're a person or all of your company's life if you know you're since inception if you're a company yeah. and invest in projects to take that out of the atmosphere um, and credible projects that are really doing good things and not just putting money into the pockets of certifiers and project developers. And, and the last thing is inspire other people to take that journey with you. And, and this is what we're doing at My Carbon Zero. We've, we've set up a, 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 a clear program. We call it R, R for reduce your own emissions, reduce emissions elsewhere, remove carbon from the atmosphere and inspire other people to do it. And we are, we are not asking people to give us money. And when they do invest in the projects that we've done a lot of due diligence on to make sure they're doing what they say they're doing, we don't take any of that money. It goes straight out to the project. People might say, how are you making your money? Well, we, we, uh, we hope to uh, um, have inspire people to say, well, we'll give you a little bit of a donation. You know, we're gonna give some money to that project, but we'll give you a bit of a donation to keep going. And on top of that, one of the things I haven't mentioned, very exciting for us. We're working there in Scotland uh, with uh, David Reid at Fuel Change, a new non-profit there in Scotland, to yep. implement what we call our My Carbon Zero education program. And Larbert High, Larbert High School is the first school in the world to be taking this sort of serious level action and partnering with My Carbon Zero. The, the, the principal there, the teachers, they're fantastic and they've got all the kids fired up. And it's about embedding long-term climate uh, uh, behavioural change so the kids can be climate ready. So that's starting in Scotland right now. And, and you know, thanks to a lot of the support that you guys are giving us too, we're looking to take yeah. that take that to scale. So we're very grateful for our partnership with, with you guys too. No, that, that's amazing. Um, I think I've maybe got a question in there about just, just your views on, um, 
your experience of the younger generation, how, like, in terms of confidence levels, how how confident are the younger generation that they can actually make a difference? Um, have you got any any thoughts on that? Yeah, look, I do a lot of talks at universities and at schools, and and I hear a lot of people saying, oh, you know, the younger generation, they're right into this, they'll sort it out. And there's a couple of problems I've got with that. One is that that means we're abrogating responsibility for our own action, and, and we're the people at our age who can make decisions to move, move needles. So I don't like that. We've got to take our responsibility. Um, but I'm also not sure that all of the kids understand the situation. You know, they can go on a march, and this is terrific, you know, with what Greta's done in the school strikes. Kids go on marches, and then they come home and what, right? We, we need to give them a path to action. And I think that's not really clear for a lot of kids at the moment. They, they, they love the school strike and they'll go and, and, but you know, usually after one of the school strikes, there's plastic bottles lying around everywhere. You know, there's rubbish. So it's like, we've got to get a bit more consistent there. And I think give the kids a path to action. And that's what we're looking to do with the My Carbon Zero Education Program and, and pump up the kids' ties because there also is climate despair. And this is a real problem that's emerging, particularly for young kids, because oldies like us, you know, we've had a lot of our life already, and I, I, we're all having, you know, there's a lot of climate despair at our age as well, but in young people in particular, because the news is full of climate disaster stories, and these kids are sort of getting worn down by it already, and I'm talking young kids, you know, and up school kids. So I think what we've got to try and do here, to, in fairness to those kids, is say, come on, let's have a go. You know, we don't want to say, look, it might be too late. It, it might be. But yeah. you won't know unless you get in there. Um, so let's let's inspire these kids. Let's give them hope. And some people say to me, "Oh, but there is no hope." Well, you know what? As long as we got breath, I think there's hope. So yeah. you know, I'm not going to just sit here on my uh, lovely chair and, and say, "Oh, it's all done. We can just give up." No way. We, we've got to put our shoulders to the wheel and try and inspire everyone to do the same. And and then we might just make it because we don't know what the future holds. Yeah. Uh, and these kids are. I think they're suffering. There's a lot of kids suffering this climate despair. You can read about it. There's there's papers about it too. So we've got to help them, mate. We've got to help them. We've got to do our bit and we've got to help them do their bit. And all shoulders to the wheel, we might just make it. Wow, that's, that's um, again, pretty powerful stuff. And I think the key word in there is hope. We, we, you know, we can't lose hope. Um, I, I, so, well, yeah, you mentioned us being involved. Like we're, we, we've been incredibly inspired by you and um, Fuel Change and Pond Foundation and everything. Um, what I want to make sure, I do have one more question, but before I ask that, um, I, w- I want to make sure that everyone listening to this knows how they can find out more. Um, so would you be able to just give a quick overview of how people can understand more about the Pond Foundation, My Carbon Zero, and, and also um, yourself? Um, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Lee. So we have a Pond Foundation website, uh, just pond, thepondfoundation.org. And um, and we also have a My Carbon Zero website. So we, we decided we'd have two websites because the My Carbon Zero one is, is pretty big. The Pond Foundation just gives you know the overview. But mycarbonzero.org, um, you can go there, there, you can join the community, it's free. Um, if you're an individual, if you're a business, there is a fee for joining, but um, it's not much because we don't want that to be a barrier for action. And then there's tools there for an individual. You can get into the, once you're in the community, as I say, it's free to get in there. There's tools there to help you work out your carbon balance for all of your life based on where you've lived. And then there's projects, there's information, there's guidance. This is what you can do. So mycarbonzero.org is the main one. And and then just if people want to learn about me, it's, um, it's just scottpointon.com. I've got my own website and that tells a bit about my experience. Probably need to update that a bit to bring in the later stuff, but um, yeah. And so, and of course, we've got various LinkedIn and um, uh, Instagram pages and all that sort of stuff. But uh, you yeah, know, I think scottpointon.com for me and mycarbonzero.org for for my carbon zero. That'd be great if people were to visit that and join the community. We, we'd love to have people coming in. Brilliant. No, that that's that's great. And the final question I had, um, it's very clear um, that. The way that you live your life um, is very much connected to nature, and it's the last question I wanted to ask. Um, I, I just want um, I wanted to understand a little bit more, and maybe a couple of tips on. Uh, let us know why 
you think it's important to be connected to nature and a couple of tips for people getting back to that um because I, I do believe it's very important yeah i agree mate 100 percent. well you know i think it's important because it helps us get connected to to this right when we go into nature nature doesn't judge us right um every day we we interact with other human beings we're being judged and uh, often negatively and that you know creates reactions and we spend our time oh that's no good and arguing and coming up with the most clever argument to try and win the, the day yeah but nature doesn't judge you and you can go and walk in a forest or sit in a heather sit near a mountain or a stream you've got beautiful landscape there in scotland um just go and spend a bit of time there and and of course that people say, oh yeah we've got to, you know, that means we've got to go a weekend away you know what you've got parks in all of your cities there i i just put a post actually today on uh on linkedin where i encourage people because i i, I trained as a forest therapy guy i'm now a, a certified forest therapy guide and part of that i was already taking people into nature but part of that was to try and deepen the experience you know, we need to build a relationship with nature we often hear people talking about let's get reconnected i don't use that term because we are nature we are part of nature and this yeah. idea of reconnected means somehow we've become separate well no we're part of nature but what we've got to do is deepen our relationship with nature so one of the tips i said today was in in forest therapy we have this thing called sit spot if you can and it's probably not going to happen every day but just go and just sit near a tree if you've got a even if you, you live in an apartment a lot of us do these days i'm lucky i live in a little village i've got a garden but just look out the window and watch the clouds go by we've all got nature around us try and find 20 minutes if you can wonderfully if you can do it every day i know that's maybe not possible where you can just sit almost and do nothing and what happens is this the, the hard drive up here starts to slow down yeah um and if you are in nature if you're in a park in the city or something like that little insects come by maybe butterflies or bees or even flies I, I was did it this morning had a mosquito desperately trying to bite me and if i wasn't in that space i probably would have given it a good whacking yeah but because i was in nature i sort of just encouraged it to go elsewhere yeah and this is part of it it just it just connects you like the the head in me said just whack that thing because it's not going to be nice if it bites you but because i built a deep relationship with nature it's like you know what i'll just i'll just shoo it away yeah i'm gonna go bite something else and I think it's really helpful for us because if you really have that relationship with nature, which is and part of the reason we've got climate change and species going extinct all over the world and the oceans are full of plastic, is because our relationship with nature is not in good shape. It's yeah. broken. It's broken. And yeah. we are poisoning the planet that sustains us. And so it's really hard to do that if you love it. Yeah. And if you if you have this beautiful relationship with with the natural world of which we are an integral part it's really hard to destroy it because you feel like you're destroying someone who you really love and so i think that's why it's really important to try and find these opportunities just to spend a bit of time if you can go away for a weekend and go for walks and things brilliant but a lot of people can't maybe they can't afford it but just find that connection if you can in your day today and you have a little plant near your desk or something like that yeah. just try and build that connection it's really powerful but I'm glad I got that question in. Uh, I think that's an important message. Uh, at the start of lockdown, I had a, a, a park nearby us where it was almost like it was a beautiful tree. It was almost like the rock had been formed to be a seat. And I, I actually found myself going there bef before work, 20 mm -hmm. minutes. I would put, um, I would listen to nature, but then I would put a, um, a little meditation on. The headspace that I cleared was yeah. incredible. Um, but what I would say is I watched that video earlier on just before our call. So I would encourage anyone to link up with you on LinkedIn because there's a lot of value in, in your videos. So thanks, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Great. Well, I think that's us coming to an end, Scott. There's been a huge amount of value there. So I'd just like to say thanks again. Um, and yeah, yeah, amazing. Keep doing the work you're doing. And I'm excited to share this with, with my network. 
Look, I appreciate it, Lee, and uh, you know, I, I appreciate the support that you're giving us too. And um, it's it's all shoulders to the wheel, and uh, you guys at Outlaw Social are really really great. I appreciate it. So, I look forward to getting over to Edinburgh and uh, and meeting all you guys. And um, that time when I well, because we can fly, but I'll have to spend two weeks in a hotel before I can come and have a beer with you. So, uh, or a habits, you know. So, yeah. um, so I look forward to being able to get over there, and yeah, maybe we can meet some of your some of your network and colleagues and. Talk, talk about these things more. Yeah, sounds sounds great. Well, uh, look forward to it. Thank you very much, Scott. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate.